What we're going to start doing now is go over Java threads in more detail. These variants of these videos were up earlier, so you could take a look at them by clicking on the links in the assignment. But I wanted to walk through this now, now that you've had a chance to play around with this stuff. And uh, it should be a little bit more meaningful to you, because you have to think about how to use threads properly for assignment 1A and, and 1B. So what we're going to do is talk about how Java threads can be used to support concurrently, can support concurrency. And as we'll see, concurrent apps are going to use threads in order to be able to simultaneously run multiple computations that potentially interact with each other. If they don't interact with each other, then the program is embarrassingly parallel. If they do interact with each other, then that leads to a whole bunch of other things we'll talk about later about synchronization and, and uh, avoiding various concurrency hazards. We'll also begin to start talking about a case study app, which is a concurrent a greatest common divisor app, which you can download and play with in Android. It's kind of fun. And uh, it demonstrates a bunch of different ways to run threads and give threads work to do. We'll also talk about alternative ways of giving code to a thread. A number of people got this wrong in assignment 1A, so I'll explain it in detail. Um, very important to understand this core concept. Otherwise, your threads will never do anything useful. And then we'll also talk about how to pass parameters to a Java thread, because that's kind of interesting to know. So let's start out by talking about the introduction. So threads are the most basic way of obtaining concurrency in Java, uh, if you think about in terms of what has to happen under the hood to get things to run. Now, some programming abstractions that Java provides, things like parallel streams, things like completable futures, actually don't require you to use threads at all directly. They're hidden from you. But we're going to focus on how to program with threads, because that's this part of the, the lesson. A thread is basically a unit of computation that runs in the context of a process. So what the heck does that mean? What is a process? So a process is a unit of resource allocation and protection. What that means is that the process allocates certain resources. We'll talk about some of those resources in just a second. And the resources in one process are protected against accidental access by threads running in other processes. You can have multiple threads in a process. You can have multiple processes. Each process can have multiple threads or not. You might have just one thread. The point is that you decide as the application programmer and or the framework developer how the threads are allocated in the processes. So you can have multiple processes, multiple threads. And in Android, at least, an application is typically implemented as a process. So each application typically runs in its own address space. As we kind of talked about in the introduction, threads in Java can communicate with each other or interact with each other by either sharing objects to communicate or interact or by passing messages to each other. So we're not going to talk much about that anymore. But if you go back and take a look at the earlier discussion, you can see more about the different models. We'll focus a little bit later on some Android-centric forms of shared memory and inter-process communication. Uh, those are not important at the moment, but we'll get to that by the time the semester is over. Each Java thread leverages some unique state from the underlying kernel, which let's assume it's Linux, just for argument's sake, but it could, of course, be Windows or other things. So assuming that we have a Linux kernel, uh, it really doesn't matter because they're all going to work the same at a conceptual level. There'll be some state that's unique to each thread. For example, there'll be a runtime stack to keep track of activation records. There'll be an instruction counter that keeps track of where in the instruction stream the thread is executing. There'll be other registers, things like frame pointers and other things to keep track of the values of, of state that's important to the, re that the thread as it's executing. And you can take a look here at this link to find out more about what goes into a thread. So some things are unique. Uh, other things can be shared. There are some things that are shared by all threads within a process. So things like objects allocated on the, the heap. If you, when you ever say you know, new, new something, new thread, new list, new array list, or whatever. In that case, the objects that are allocated can actually be shared amongst the threads. Or not. I mean, it's sort of up to you. Uh, you can also have static objects, objects that are created uh, when the program starts to run, which may or may not be allocated by new if it's a, an array of some kind. Uh, sorry, it's a primitive objects or so on. Um, but static objects, objects that are allocated when the program starts, can also be shared across threads. So those things are common state. So something's unique, some things are common. Uh, 
and shared. Here's the quick overview of the case study. If you take a look at this link, you can see the case study. So what it does is it prompts you with a bunch of different ways to run a Java thread. And then you select one of these ways. And one way to do it is by implementing the runnable interface, which we'll talk about. So that's obviously run runnable. And that goes ahead and does these GCD computations. It takes some big numbers and some random big numbers and figures out the GCD of them. Uh, you can also inherit from the thread class itself. We'll talk about that. That's another way to do things. And then there's sort of a variant uh, of doing all this stuff as well. So let's talk about these different ways of giving code to a thread. So you have to give code to a thread in order for it to run. And, and by have to or you must, what I mean is if you don't, then strange things happen. So if you use the default constructor, you say you know thread t equal new thread, open close, then you're going to create a thread, which you can go ahead and start, but it's not going to do anything because you didn't give it any computation to run. So it'll just stop. I mean, it'll, it'll just uh, shut down immediately after you call start because there's nothing for it to do. So do not use the default thread constructor directly. A bunch of people in your programs were allocating threads and not giving them any work. And so of course, your program was not working properly. Um, you might ask the question, why would anybody ever use the no argument constructor here? And there's a little stack overflow posting that explains why that's the case. And it really has to do with subclassing of things and anonymous inner classes and so on. But don't use it directly like this, new thread t.start, it'll just be a, a no-op. So there are a couple of reasonable, way, re realistically useful ways to give Java code to Java threads. So one way, which is arguably the easiest way, depending on your definition of easiest, is simply to extend the Java thread class. So you can see here we have the Java thread class that comes out of the box for you. And you can simply come along and extend it, this, this little symbol is the UML diagram for inheritance. So GCD thread extends thread, and it implements the run method to do something or other. We don't really care at the moment what that something or other is. It just does some stuff. Um, and what you're doing here is you're overriding the run hook method in the subclass, and then defining the computation that you want to have performed. What you would then do is you'd go ahead and make yourself a new instance of GCD thread, and then start it. And this is using a, a named subclass. We have a named subclass, GCD thread. Another way to do this is to go ahead and anonymously start an instance, or, or sorry, start an anonymous instance of GCD thread. So we say new GCD thread, open closed. That makes an anonymous instance of the GCD thread. And then we start it, and then it'll start to run. That's another way to do things. That would be most useful if there's no reason you want to synchronize on anything. Whereas doing it like this might be useful if you want to synchronize somehow on GCD thread, on, on the GCD thread uh, object. Another way to do things is to implement the runnable interface. So there's an interface called runnable, has a single method called run, which is what's often called a functional interface in Java. We'll talk a bit more about that when we talk about some of the Java 8 features and functional programming. And what you do here is you simply implement that interface. And we can define the run hook method to explain what you want to have happen when things run. Um, there's a couple of different ways to handle this. One way is to implement it using the implements keyword. So we have GCD runnable implements runnable. We put the code to run here. And then we make a new instance of a named class as the runnable. So we say new GCD runnable. And we call that GCD runnable with a lowercase g. And then we can go ahead and make ourselves a new thread, and we can pass the runnable to the thread and start it. So that's creating an anonymous uh, thread given the GCD runnable, and we start it and go ahead and run it. So that's one way to do things. So in this case, we make a new thread, and we give it the runnable to run. The alternative way to do this is to have an anonymous inner class as the runnable. So notice how we say new thread, open paren. Now we're going to give it the code to run. And using the sort of Java 7 verbose carpal tunnel syndrome inducing syntax, we say new runnable, we say public void run, we put the code we want to run in here, and that's anonymous, that's an anonymous object, and we say dot start. So that's going to go ahead and run that anonymous object.
This idiom is used a lot in sort of older code, code that's Java 7 and before. And you see that a lot in Android and Java code. Nowadays, of course, no self-respecting Java 8 programmer would ever write such horrible, verbose code. And instead, you would use Lambda expressions. So what you would do here is you would say open close, which is just a way of saying this Lambda expression takes no parameters. Arrow, which is just syntax that says there's a Lambda expression coming. And then you provide the code you want to have run between the open, close, curly braces. And depending on what you put in there, you might even be able to uh, elide or omit the open, close, curly braces. So a Lambda expression is essentially an unnamed block of code. This, this does not have a name, right? It just has the code. And it has optional parameters. In this case, there are none. That can be passed around, stored, and executed later. So as you can see here, what we're doing is we're passing this Lambda expression here into the thread constructor, where it will be stashed away. And then when the thread is started, that Lambda will be run. So it happens that that conforms to the run method of the runnable interface, which is a functional interface. And therefore, we can pass the code in there directly. So this is nice and concise and, as I mentioned before, sort of the preferred way of doing things if you're lucky enough to, to uh, program with Java 8. It can get a little bit unwieldy, however, if the code that you want to run is very long or complex. If you have you know, 200 lines worth of stuff, jamming it all into a Lambda expression is probably not the thing to do. Second goal. Likewise, if you want to reuse this code over and over again, then you probably want to store it as a variable and then pass it to multiple objects, multiple things that need it. Cole, yes. Oh, yeah, great question. So what I could have done, and I probably, I'll revise these slides and show this. I could go ahead and say, you know, runnable uh, R. Well, actually, I'll tell you what. I will do this in real time. This is uh, runtime adaptation, let's say so. Let's make a copy, copy and paste it. New slide, let's make it bigger. I also could have said instead, Something like runnable r equal open close, you know, dot, 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 whatever. And then I could have said r. So this would have been the same, this would have the same effect. I could define this thing. Let me go ahead and. Put it back in slideshow mode so you can see it a little better. There you go. So I could have defined myself a runnable R, could have called it whatever I wanted to, it's just a, a local variable, given it the Lambda expression. So I can create the Lambda expression, store it, and then I can pass it as a parameter to the thread where it'll be stashed and then called back after start begins to run, it causes a thread to start to run. So that's an example of storing the Lambda in a variable and then passing that variable as a parameter. Was that your question? Okay. Good question. Other questions? Okay. So again, thinking about your assignment, uh, your assignment 1A, there's a bunch of places where you create threads. And this is sort of one convenient way of doing this sort of thing. And there's various, a bunch of variants. And if you read the frequently made mistakes description I gave, it'll talk about the uh, different alternative ways to do things. You can use Lambda expressions. You can use method references. There's all kinds of stuff you can do to make that work. OK, the, the last topic in this part of the lesson is passing parameters to a Java thread. So if you look carefully, you'll see that the, the run method, or the run methods defined in Java thread and in runnable, right? So here's runnable, here's thread. Neither of these things take any parameters whatsoever. So that obviously raises the question, how do you pass parameters to a Java thread? How does that work? Well. There's a couple of different ways to do this. One way is to pass the parameters as parameters to the constructor of a class that's going to implement either thread or runnable, or extend thread or implement runnable. So here's an example. You can take a look at this piece of code to see this example. We have GCD runnable, which extends random. Ignore that for a moment. And implements runnable. The key thing here is that we implement runnable. 
we define ourselves some fields. This is just called um, M activity. Don't worry too much about that. That's what, what Android uses in order to be able to uh, display information to the user, like prompt them for, for input and give them output. And then we define ourselves a, con a constructor for this class that takes a main activity as a parameter and it stashes it away. And then when the thread is run, so when, when run is run, when runnable's run is run, <laughs> it's a mouthful, we then go ahead and use the M activity in order to do stuff that we need to have here. So we're going to print something out. Right? So you can see that we passed a parameter to run indirectly by passing it as a parameter to the object that is a runnable, that implements runnable. And then the run method can simply access that parameter as a field. So that's one very common way of doing things. And here's an example of how this would work. So you say uh, main activity, run runnable, new thread, new GCD runnable, this, this being main activity, which is going to be passed into this constructor up here. And that's how we get this object visible into the runnable. OK, that's one way to do things. Another way to do things, which is a little bit more flexible, is to have setter methods. So in this case, we might say GCD thread extends thread. That's a different variant. So rather than implementing runnable, we're going to extend thread. And in this case, we go ahead and define two fields, main activity and also random, because we're no longer extending random. And so we define these fields as sort of the parameters that we want to have passed. Then we define a bunch of setter methods, right? Like set activity, set random, and so on. So these are methods that are public. You can call them. You can pass in the parameters that you want. Notice how we use the so-called fluent interface model, where each of these setter methods returns the instance of the class we're defining. And I'll show you how you use these things in a second. They're used to chain together a, um, or to, to chain together a set of setter calls or, or method calls on an object. Here's how we might have this work. In the run method, we're going to go ahead and use M activity like we did before. We might also use M random, which is another field to get random numbers we want to use for our, our processing. So we can use the fields within the thread to customize the behavior of what the heck's going on. And then here's how we could actually put all the things in motion. So notice how we use a fluent interface. And we say new GCD thread. That obviously returns a GCD thread object. We then say set activity this. That returns the GCD thread object. We, said, we then say set random, new random. So basically, this allows you to kind of cascade these calls together. And you see this used all the time in modern Java programs for things like builder patterns and other kinds of things to create objects with the various fields. Um, it's a little bit more flexible than using uh, constructor parameters because you can make the object and then set its fields the way you want later. Although you have to remember to call these things, otherwise they won't be set, which can be a little confusing. That's why it's a pattern. It's basically the builder pattern. OK, any questions about any of that stuff? Yeah, Joe. Um, is start ever overridden? That's a good question. We would have to go and look and see if start is a final method. It probably is, although don't, don't hold me to it, um, because you typically don't want to override start, because start is going to end up setting in motion a bunch of low-level gobbledygook that you really don't want to know how it works. I'll actually explain how it works later, so you will have to know how it works. But as a user of this stuff, you don't want to have to know how it works in terms of the details, because it's very platform-specific and low-level. But in a nutshell, what it does is it creates a new, uh, it works with lower layers in the stack, and it creates a new operating system thread. And then it passes a little shim in there that works in a way that allows the run hook method to get called back after the new thread starts to run in the new stack. OK, so that's the end of the Java Threads overview.